The year is 2022, and one of the absolute most popular cartoons that currently exists is independently produced and released on YouTube. I don't think we talk enough about how much of a miracle that actually is. Hell of a Boss not only garners tens of millions of views per episode, but it has one of the most active and dedicated fan bases on the internet. Videos about the show get millions of views themselves. Not only is this wildly impressive, it's wildly important. While it is, at least for now, an outlier, it proves that with the right support, successful animation can be produced outside of the existing studio system. Hell of a Boss is likely funded via YouTube ad revenue, Patreon subscriptions, and merchandising, but regardless of how all of these things shape together into its budget, it cannot be understated how remarkable this is. While Netflix is completely dismantling its in-house animation studio, killing a dozen in series in its wake, it's so encouraging to see a series not just survive, but thrive independently of a network or streaming service. And while it does require a lot of support from its fans, it proves that this is possible. It proves that if people like an idea enough, that idea can happen. But even more remarkable is that the show provides an animated experience unlike anything else. It really is a unique series with so much to admire and so much to give. So today, I wanna dive into, in my opinion, the thing that stands out above all, the heart of Hell of a Boss. But before I explore the more heartfelt aspects of the show, I want to gush for a minute about the world building, because I really love how the world is unfolding before us. So if you aren't aware of the show's history, which I'm sure most of you are, Hell of a Boss is actually a spin-off of another pilot, Has Been Hotel. Incredibly, Has Been Hotel was bought by A24 to be produced and distributed, and honestly, the broad premise of Has Been is undeniably genius. You know all those Disney princesses who sing everything they do like their life is a musical? What if that was literally the princess of hell, Satan's daughter herself? It's simple, but damn if it isn't a fun subversion. And while we've really only got the pilot of Has Been for now, it goes a long way to build out the world that would soon be expanded in Hell of a Boss. Because while working on Has Been, series creator Vivian Medrano got an idea for a spin-off series set in the exact same world. And though the series will likely not be able to directly cross over and reference each other all that much from here on out, due to Has Been being an A24 production and Hell of a remaining independent, the world the world they both inhabit still very much feels one and the same, at least so far. Has Been Hotel is set around this big idea that the daughter of Satan wants to rehabilitate the sinners of hell so that they can graduate and move up to heaven. Hell of a Boss focuses on a company in hell called IMP. They're hired to go to Earth and exact revenge at their customer's behest, mostly through murder. There are hierarchies of demons in hell, the devil's daughter Charlie is obviously pretty high ranking, whereas the characters seen in Hell of a Boss are imps, the lowest of the low. Setting these two series around characters who exist in such different places within the same world makes it feel so big. It feels like there are so many places to explore within the depths of hell, so many customs and social dynamics to navigate. And on top of that, these characters primarily live in just one of the nine rings of hell, and we've only seen four of them so far. The Pride Ring is where the events of Has Been Hotel's pilot takes place, as well as most of Hell of a Boss, but there are even separate cities in this ring. Pentagram City is where the Has Been Hotel itself resides, while Imp City houses office space for IMP, out of which the Hell of a Boss characters operate their business. But we've also spent time in the Greed Ring. What we've seen is an underworld amusement park called Lululand, short for Lucifer Luciferland, I can only assume. We've also been to the Wrath Ring, which appears to be a more rural area of hell, filled with farmer, rancher type folks. One of our main characters, Millie, even grew up there. And of course, the Lust Ring, basically hell's red light district, filled with debaucherous clubs. I'm a huge fan of the way that this world is slowly being opened up more and more, revealing not only the different layers of hell, but how these layers differentiate from one another. I think your typical less interesting depiction of hell would just be a big lake of lava and fire, but by using inspiration from Dante with the Nine Circles, it makes hell feel like an entire planet, albeit a vertical one. I love the detail that they take these massive communal elevators between each ring. But even aside from the ever-expanding world building of Hell itself, the series also dips its toes into both heaven and earth in pretty meaningful ways. We really only get glimpses of heaven through Cherub, basically the heavenly version of IMP that bestows blessings onto earthlings at the behest of heaven citizens, but we also get a sense that there's a lot of problematic bureaucracy involved in heaven's hierarchy, particularly with Cherub, and I love how they're feeding us these little tidbits as we go. Earth, on the other hand, 
and is used in fascinating ways so far. We mostly see the IMP members taking out humans as they're contracted to do, but what I love most is that we also see the ramifications of these persistent murders. Basically, government agencies are on the lookout for the imps committing these acts, and there's an entire episode based on them actually catching Blitz and Moxie. This reminds me of something I had always wanted to see in the series Infinity Train, and something Owen Dennis hinted that they wanted to cover in later seasons before it was cancelled. In that world, we know that the Infinity Train is real, and that it's literally abducting people, many of which return with full knowledge of the train itself, not to mention reflectionless Tulip and Lake as further proof, so there must be people trying to track the train and figure out how it works in the real world. That's the energy that these government agencies bring the hell of a slash has been world. With these imps running around murdering, they can't just do it without repercussions, so they're dead set on proving their existence to the world at large. It's a cool angle and it definitely seems like it's going to remain in play in a big way, since they effectively now have proof of the imps' existence. I also love how our character roles tie into this world building. The hell of a team being lowly imps means they shouldn't have access to Earth, but thanks to Stolas, a full-on royal demon, they're able to work a deal. Basically, Blitz is his occasional boy toy in exchange for this book, a demonic seal that allows allows traveling between realms. Blitz and Co. use this to carry out their murders for their customer base. But interestingly, this plot point and piece of world building does tie into that aforementioned heart that the show is full of. Stolas is such an interesting character. He's this royal prince demon living in a place of privilege in hell. He has a wife and a daughter, and he absolutely loves his daughter Octavia. There's this gorgeous musical sequence in season 1 episode 2's Lululand, set when Octavia was a child and after she has a nightmare. And the music isn't just a beautiful medley that helps put his daughter to sleep, it's a lament of the life that has passed him by. Now all my stories have been told, except for one. When we jump forward in time, we see Octavia is now a teenager and things are different. It feels like we've jumped past that story that had yet to be told. The episode focuses around Stolas taking Octavia to Lululand, something she loved as a child but doesn't care for any longer. So now Stolas is desperately trying to maintain that connection with his daughter, but he also invites Blitz to join them as he hopelessly attempts to forge a new connection, start a new story to be told with Blitz. And my heart breaks for both Stolas and Octavia in this one. As Stolas fails to connect with Blitz, he also fails to see that he can forge a new connection with his daughter rather than holding on to the one that is long past. And Octavia expresses her pain about her home life. That sure, she used to love Lululand as a kid when her parents loved each other go home but home doesn't even feel like home anymore you ruined it but this moment of open honesty is what it takes for these two to connect once again thanks dad you're okay sometimes thank you via and other relationships in the series really shine through as well particularly moxie and millie who are just balls to the wall in love with each other Moxie is a weapons expert, but he's a bit more reserved, a bit less extroverted, and a bit less comfortable with the indiscriminate murder. On the other hand, Millie is an absolute beast who is itching for death and destruction, but they are completely smitten for one another. There's this scene in episode 6, Truth Seekers, after Moxie and Blitz get captured by the Dorks government agency, and Millie just goes absolutely apeshit with concern, willing to do literally anything to help Moxie. <laughs> Moxie is always playing these love songs for Millie, and they just have this beautiful juxtaposition to the setting. They're a sweet and soft and kind oasis amidst the chaos. You make me glad I live in hell. Our love is a story sweet to tell. And even this gets interrupted by these cynical, angry demons who see this kind of outspoken love as weak. But by the end of the episode, Millie just outright rejects this hate, and Moxie finishes his song for her. I'll always give you my best. And if you can offer the same fate, we'll handle the rest. It's really sweet, and this public display deeply affects Blitz, and not in a positive way. I think Blitz is probably the deepest character in the show, and they've yet to fully explore the depths of his fears and his insecurities, but I think we can unpack a lot of what he feels through his actions. It's clear Blitz cares for others, despite the fact that he covers it up with roasts, jokes, and criticisms, 
but he's always there for his team, and he would never give up on them. But to me, it's also clear that Blitz desperately craves the kind of connection love and family brings, but something is holding him back from opening himself up fully to that possibility. He has an unhealthy obsession with Moxie and Millie's relationship, probably because it is so earnest and real and genuine. It's something he's jealous of, something he wishes he could find, but something he's incapable of properly pursuing. Blitz seems to keep his lovers at an arm's length, unwilling to connect with them in meaningful ways. His ex Verasica chastises him for his selfish behavior in their relationship, and he effectively uses Stolas any chance he gets. Stolas clearly has a real love and affection for Blitz, yet when he reaches his hand out for him, Blitz pulls back. In the episode Truth Seekers, there's this internalized dream sequence where Blitz is confronted with his own insecurities head on, and it outright says he struggles with forming these meaningful connections. Yet you still shove away anyone who gets too close until they resent you for being a selfish shit. <laughs> Blitz even tries to form familial connections. The adoption of Luna seems to be some sort of desperate attempt at a meaningful bond, though of course as a teenager who was adopted at age 17, Luna doesn't quite see it the same way. But this has to be a symptom of these insecurities that are eating Blitz up inside. Symptoms of his desperation for connection. We get hints throughout the show that Blitz has a twin sister and formerly had a duo act with her at the circus. We don't know the exact details of what deteriorated that relationship, and we haven't seen her in the flesh yet, but Blitz clearly still has love and adoration for his time with her. He keeps a poster of their act up in the IMP offices. And I think Blitz's family was the last real relationship he had, the last one he actually opened up and gave his entire self to. And whatever caused that relationship to break down is exactly what is keeping him from being open again. The end of episode seven shows Blitz alone on his couch, scrolling through photos and it explicitly shows at least one photo of all of his friendships and relationships we've seen in the show. But only one gives him pause. It's a photo seemingly of him, his sister, and his mother. And it causes him to absolutely break down. I think that this was the last time Blitz truly felt love and felt loved. But why is any of this heartfelt nonsense important in a show like Hell of a Boss? Why does any of this matter here? Well, to me, not only does it anchor this show to reality, but it's the most important aspect of the show when it comes to its messaging. Because when you look at the show as a whole, beneath all of the vulgarity, the violence, the absolute debauchery, the thing that continues to shine through and make the biggest impact is this genuine emotion. The connections that these people make and find important. The meaning that they can find in their chaotic lives. And isn't that just the perfect takeaway for us all here on Earth as well? That even in the depths of hell, love and connection can exist. And if it can exist there, then it sure as hell should exist here. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed this little hell of a boss essay. I've really grown to love this show and fully intend on covering season two as it airs. I'm also thinking that it's pretty prime for some character analysis videos as we get more episodes down the road. So let me know if that's something you're interested in. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you next time. Peace. Johnny! Two